Hey everyone, I'm your host Jace, and welcome to the inaugural episode of Interesting Randomness. Wow. Some preamble first. I've had many people over the years tell me to do something with my voice, and while I fooled around with it I had a college radio show, along with doing comedy work, I've never focused on refining it in a more narration-focused way. This series is not meant to be an exhaustive deep dive. Think of this as something to watch in bed before sleeping, at work during lunch, or during a stint on the toilet while you wonder what possessed you to try the Diablo sauce at that taqueria you usually go to. So with that said, let's begin our pilot episode, the focus of which will be... HOT SAUCE! I'm willing to assume most of you know what hot sauce is. If not, please keep watching, but keep in mind that bibing copious amounts of hot sauce will not, in fact, make you more attractive. Believe me, I've tried. Now, in order to really understand the history of hot sauce, we need to go way back, back at the time. As far back as 7000 BCE, chili peppers were being eaten and domesticated by humans living in what is now Mexico's Tehuacan Valley. I probably mispronounced that horribly, sorry. Like the other New World crops such as corn, potatoes, and beans, chili peppers did not leave the Americas until the arrival of Christopher Columbus. What that means is until chilies arrived at the Old World in the year 1493, cuisine in a wide variety of cultures were lacking some of the dishes that we'd consider iconic to their cuisines at the present day. Indian, Thai, and Chinese cuisine lack chili peppers. There's no Spanish pimenton, no Hungarian paprika, no Tunisian harissa, and kimchi, which some of you might be familiar with as pungent spicy Korean pickled cabbage, only exists in its white varieties with no spice. Aztecs, during the period leading up to the arrival of Christopher Columbus and the Conquistadors, had already begun producing very simple sauces, made from chilies mashed and mixed with water. With early colonists and Europeans alarmed by the tomato, related distantly to the poisonous nightshade plant, you could probably imagine their reluctance at trying the also distantly related chili pepper as well. It wasn't until the early 1800s that the first commercial pepper sauces were sold in Massachusetts, and the evidence for that itself is shaky, as the only records are referenced newspaper ads that are difficult to come by. Dave DeWitt cites in his A Brief History of U.S. Commercial Hot Sauces that Massachusetts city directories bore advertisements for bottled cayenne sauce. Arguably the most impactful moment for hot sauce in a pre-modern world was when Colonel Monsell White began growing Tabasco chilies as a side project in his plantation's estate in Deer Range. A letter from a visitor, printed in the New Orleans Daily Delta, recounted, I must not omit to notice the Colonel's pepper patch, which is two acres in extent, all planted with a new species of red pepper which Colonel White has introduced in his country, called Tabasco Red Pepper. The Colonel attributes the admirable health of his hands to the free use of this pepper. Now, a few of you may be going, Wait a second, Tobasco? You mean Tabasco, right? Tobasco was an early misspelling of Tabasco, a Mexican state at the time, and the future namesake of the staple hot sauce. The Colonel would eventually share some of his peppers with a friend, Edward McElhenney, who planted the chilies at his own plantation on Avery Island. During the American Civil War, the McElhenney family was forced to flee to Texas, only to find that their plantation of sugarcane crop was in ruins upon their return. However, enough chili plants to survive for him to rebuild his chili patch, and eventually, after much experimentation, Edward McElhenney created the first commercial version of the Tabasco hot sauce. By straining mashed chilies, the resulting juice would be mixed with vinegar and salt and aged in 50-gallon white oak barrels. In 1868, McElhenney packaged his aged sauce in 350 used cologne bottles and sent them as samples to likely wholesalers. The sauce was so popular that orders poured in for thousands of bottles priced at $1 each wholesale. Now, before you guys are like, wait, $1 each? That's cheap, right? No, that's the equivalent of paying $19.23 today for a single bottle of Tabasco. Business exploded. In 1870, McElhenney obtained a patent for the hot sauce, and in 1872, he opened up an office in London to manage the growing European demand for his hot sauce. As one might expect, the increasing demand and success of Tabasco spawned other hot sauces, produced by those hoping to profit off of consumers' demand for heat. Some of the most famous hot sauces to have been born in this period and to still exist include Frank's Red Hot Sauce, Crystal Hot Sauce, and Original Louisiana Hot Sauce, among others. Now, I realize that was quite the mouthful <laughs> of hot sauce history, so let's shift gears to peppers and sauces themselves. The most important thing to cover here is the Scoville scale. Think of this as a rating system for how spicy a chili pepper is, measured as Scoville heat units, based on the amount of capsation, or the chemical compound primarily responsible for heat, that the pepper contains. The higher the number, 
the more likely you will immediately regret your life choices after consuming said pepper or sauce. At the bottom, around a thousand heat units or below, are things like bell peppers, pimientos, and poblano peppers. Not very spicy at all, unlike that feral kitten I have wrapped in a burrito currently. Jalapenos, serrano peppers, tabasco peppers, and cayenne peppers occupy the 5,000 to 50,000 heat units range. Most people unused to spicy food or without much heat tolerance will probably stop around here. The 100,000 heat unit range and up is where some of my personal favorite hot sauces like to reside. Here, you'll find habaneros, scotch bonnets, and some varieties of Thai chilies, many of which go particularly well with fruity flavors. Once you get to the 800,000 heat unit range, you start hitting what my friend called the danger zone, right before he ate a raw ghost pepper to prove his point. Suffice to say, his bathroom that night became a blasting zone. This part of the heat scales where peppers such as ghost peppers, Carolina reapers, Trinidad scorpions, and naga vipers reside. These peppers have so much capsaicins packed into them that you risk burning your hands if you handle them without protection. Of special note is Pepper X, created by Ed Curry, the man also responsible for the birth of the Carolina Reaper. While unconfirmed by the Guinness Book of World Records, Ed and other reports place Pepper X's Scoville heat level at 3.18 million. For reference, the Carolina Reaper clocks in at 2.2 million, while the average ghost pepper hovers around a million. For context, law enforcement grade pepper spray, that clocks in around 2 to 5 million Scoville heat units. You are literally putting the equivalent of pepper spray in your mouth when you try one of these peppers. The extreme end of the scale aside, how then do we turn this cornucopia of heat and deliciousness into the hot sauces we know and love? Suffice to say, there are myriad methods. Some sauces, like Tabasco, are made from peppers that are aged and then fermented over the course of years. Others are made from pickled chilies, and still more can be made from fresh ones. One of the biggest choices is choosing your primary liquid to mix with your peppers. Some sauces are water-based, while others are vinegar-based. Fermenting chilies at home is also quite safe and easy to do compared to many other fruits and vegetables, as their natural heat dissuades the growth of harmful bacteria while attracting good bacteria. The sky's the limit with hot sauce, as the kinds you can create are limited only by your imagination and available ingredients. I've tasted apple jalapeno hot sauces, mustard-based hot sauces, and even one that had coffee mixed in. If you'd like to try your hand at homemade hot sauce, I'll link some videos or recipes in the description, so head on down after the end. Before I sign off on our first episode, I'd like to thank you all for giving the video a chance of watching all the way through. If this is something you'd be interested in seeing more of, or if you'd prefer a podcast format, please leave your thoughts, feedback, and commentary below. Thank you, and have a wonderful day.